Hello and welcome to another Precision Fire Repairs video. For more information about S gauge trains and the repair, upgrade, and conversion services available from me at Precision Fire Repairs, please feel free to visit my website at precisionflyerrepairs.com or, of course, email me at precisionflyerrepairs at gmail.com. Thank you. This video is an augmentation of the Anatomy 101, a Gilbert American Fire Steam Engine, in that it's going to primarily focus on the differences between a smoke and tender steam engine, which is the case here, as opposed to the smoke and boiler, which was in the 303 Atlantic of the original Anatomy 101 Gilbert American Fire Steam Engine video. And so I'm hopefully not going to take 20 minutes of your time because I'll be skipping over things that are relatively redundant between this and the 303 with focus on those things which are different about it. But this is a 322 smoke and tender Hudson. So it's a 464 steam engine design. Uh, this steam chest comes off, so it's separate. There's just one screw that holds it on. Uh, with the 303, which was a single piece plastic injected body, the smoke box and the steam chest were all part of the shell. In this case, um, it's a multiple part die cast metal shell and uh, a beautiful example, I think, of uh, flyer steam engine production. And um, inside, there are two body tabs in the back, body mounts up front that uh, screws get put into, and unique to this smoke and tender shell while we're here is this uh, nipple that comes from the smoke stack insert through and then parallel to the ceiling of the boiler shell onto which a rubber hose that will run the full length of this and out the back of the cab to um, a nipple on the tender through which then smoke is actually propelled and it exhausts out the stack when that's all fully assembled. The other components of the engine, uh, this is the pilot which uh, has the cow catcher and the uh, front steps or ladder up to the running boards that go along both sides of the boiler shell. Then it has a pivoting four truck and sliding pilot that's spring loaded. There is the trailing truck that has four wheels in this case. The rear ones are a, a larger outside diameter than the front ones and that just gets drawn along underneath the firebox. And then there is the smoke box and the smoke box on this one is a separate part. It has to have uh, some wings put on it as part of the repair. Here is the smoke box. A plastic lens also needs to be inserted. Um, the uh, light bulb does not attach to this. The light bulb in these early production steamers is actually attached to the chassis as you'll see shortly. And of course then the beautiful chrome handrails that run on each side of the boiler help to make this a true model. I believe they referred to it as S-gauge engine. Let's take a look at the tender because this is the main differentiator between it and later production models. Uh, from 46 to part of 47, uh, American Flyer actually had um, uh, two engines inside their engine, if you counted the number of motors involved anyway. Inside the tender, uh, there is a motor here. It's an AC motor with an armature and a field and a machined in worm gear as part of the armature shaft. It's got brushes. It's got a rear bearing. It's got a forward bearing. Um, it's got an oil wick in the front for the bearing that should be soaked and kept wet. Uh, the bushings, I mean the uh, brushes are slotted and held in place with these bent uh, tensioned hair springs. And um, there's um, a bell crank and push rod mechanism here that as the motor spins, the bellow is compressed and then expanded, compressed and expanded. When it is compressed, that forces air into this chooch chamber 
and a hole in a metal plate makes that chewed sound emit and then the air continues on its way to pressurize the smoke chamber where the heat created by a coiled element between these two posts vaporizes the smoke fluid that you've put into the chamber through this fill tube after of course removing and replacing the cap and then that vaporized smoke is pushed out of the chamber into this nipple and through that rubber hose on its way hopefully with enough pressure and momentum and clear passage to get all the way up to the uh, smokestack of the engine and delight all its viewers with terrific smoke in sync with the chooch back here generated uh, again by the bellows. There is a piston and cylinder kit that was later used to replace the bellows because they are vulnerable to uh, cracking and needing replacement. Um, there's an on off switch so if you don't want to run smoke you can turn it off it moves this contact away from that um, post and then moves that contact back in touch with it uh, so you don't have to have the chooch or the smoke on all the time um, it's a really pretty fascinating thing they did to generate smoke for a steam engine you can imagine in the 40s how thrilled people were to even get this um, when you do run it with the smoke on of course there is some reduction of power that's given to the motor that drives the engine forward because the current is taken up by this motor in addition to the coil and then also shared with the motor in the uh, engine so it's not unusual for you to experience a speed increase of the motor for at the same voltage setting when you turn the smoke off than when you turn the smoke on it's just having to share the current that much more with it on and underneath you have your leaf pickup springs uh, one on the forward truck one on the rear truck um, you don't have a pickup shoe which came on the later one so there's actually three wheel sets per truck and uh, the middle one picks up power to provide to the side frame because this whole side frame is of course energized uh, with electricity so it doesn't hurt but the the real connectivity is with these leaf springs on um, the fore and aft axle of uh, each truck it's usually a link coupler engine but it's not uncommon to have these made into knuckle couplers this one's been converted previously um, knuckle couplers are just a little more convenient and uh, ubiquitous in terms of um, amount of rolling stock that you can find to attach to an engine and then here's the draw bar there are only two leads that go to the engine um, and that's really uh, because the reverse unit and the motor are all up in the engine boiler not back here uh, power is only needed here uh, to drive this smoke unit so that's the smoke in tender tender interior if you will of a smoke and tender Gilbert American Flyer steam engine. And then we get up to uh, the chassis, and, and as you all know, um, I have a, a lot of respect for this as a key component to any engine. I think the chassis and the condition of its axles and wheels really set the stage in many ways for how the engine and, and tr overall is going to perform in the end. Um, this one, being an early model, um, has brass inserts that were put in by the factory for the axles to spin in. Later, as with the diesels, they dropped this because of cost. Um, I like them to have the brass inserts. It's just that much more longer lasting uh, design. They also have the hollow cutouts here, and they have little drop buttons which initially and originally, or when new, were spring-loaded, uh, but those eventually fail. This was designed to do certain things when the engine would go over um, specific three-rail sections of track, but it never got really utilized or taken to market very much and soon dropped from the engines when realized that's not really going to be taken advantage of. The... Um, thing to look for, of course, is axle wear in these bushings. Now, it's interesting, really, it isn't that often that a steam engine chassis um, 
has axle hole wear problems nowhere near the frequency that um, diesel motors do and uh, there are probably a number of reasons that contribute to that these for some reason I think people felt more uh, compelled or likely to oil and uh, the diesel ones with the two little oil holes on the bottom might have been all that people thought of unless they took the side frame off um, even without taking anything off you can kind of see axles come through this chassis and you you might be compelled to get a little oil or something down in there also um, for the same distance traveled a steamer driver rotates less than the smaller diameter diesel wheel will so for the same miles the rotational wear on a steamer bearing is going to be less and another differentiator is diesel chassis are live they're carrying current and uh, you better hope your um, steamer in most cases except the very later production um, is isolated um, and insulated from any current when you have a live axle inside a hole and it might be jostling about you can have um, additional wear contributed to it by some arcing and pitting and then pitting is soft and erodes and eventually uh, the fact that it's um, conducting electricity through the hole in the frame body um, start to wear those holes and diesels out as well but largely and most often and in this case uh, the holes through steamer chassis that have been given any care and maintenance over the years are usually uh, still worth reusing. This one's been completely degreased and made uh, ready for reassembly. Um, the wheels on it have all been uh, disassembled and reassembled. Um, it was a good thing because they were all um, suffering from loosening components. Uh, we, I had um, rims loose on insulators, insulators loose on hubs, some hubs loose on axles, you name it and uh, in taking each one of these apart it was very evident to me it was a good thing that they were being taken apart cleaned and reassembled so that they'd be secure um, with um, clean contact between all the parts and modern adhesives now as well in the process they uh, they get nice and um, true and uh, gauged um, correctly and uh, when you spin them, you can just see what a good amount of clearance it has with the chassis frame and how even it keeps that distance. That's the trueness of it. And next, when they go on, they'll be quartered. I really like to get that straight rotational trueness because um, it helps to make the engine roll and run that much smoother and faster in the end. And, and I, and I kind of like that. Um, gyroscopic look that it takes on when when all the parts are put together well and and things are in good order you may have been familiar with gyroscopes you just spin it and that inside seems to stay on track real cleanly all the time um, the other parts that sit on top of the engine chassis in the case of a smoke and tender are um, the same four position reverse unit that you see in many Gilbert engines uh, just happened to be in the tender of the 303 because the smoke and choo choo are up in the boiler. And the field in which the uh, armature spins present once again, uh, as well as a brush housing. Now, what's interesting here is the brushes are not of the round shouldered type, they are of the cylindrical slotted type. And the springs that hold them in against the commutators of the spinning armature are not coil springs with end caps over them, but instead these tensioned hair springs, which then slip back into these slots. But you have the same need. You need to make sure that these are of the proper tension, uh, that they're going to position the brush correctly, that these passages through which the brushes exist are clean, that the... Um, rear armature bearing is not worn out or loose in this housing many of the same things that i pointed out before this is the um, connector or plug board that goes in the back of the cab up near its roof line uh, and the uh, two plugs from the tender connect into that the armature 
is of an earlier type. You can see how wide the segments are from each other, whereas the later types were um, with these much closer to each other. There is no oil splash guard on the back, so you don't put a washer back here where it can rest between these segments and cause shorting out. Um, the worm is uh, machined out of the armature shaft as always and before. Uh, this one's been cleaned, polished, its gaps cleaned, its continuity between segments confirmed, and the omens resistance checked and measured to make sure it is the same segment to segment and within spec. So that's all come out good. The slotted brushes you can see here um, are different than the uh, round shouldered ones but serve the same purpose. You just got to make sure that you uh, get them and use them. One thing I didn't mention earlier was um, it's good to not only make sure these are clean but actually measure the resistance of the brushes that are in a motor. That's true for the diesels as well because eventually they can become so impregnated with grease and oil and foreign matter, including metal filings, that they develop a resistance higher than they ought to have. They ought to have a very low resistance. And if you start getting um, whole number ohms of resistance, um, it's probably a good time for you to change the um, brush, even if it looks like it's an adequate length to reuse. Uh, there's a um, oil wick that goes in the back and uh, I like to soak them, soften them up, dry them out, get them ready for some fresh oil. The uh, tender in this case did need the shoulder bushing replaced, uh, so I did both. This one was cracked and looking a little suspect, and now that'll help insulate it from the chassis. The tube that runs from the tender to and up through the boiler shell um, is important and you know there's a difference